Okay. I think we're working. All right, great. Okay, so um, what we're going to cover is benign breast disorders. Um, breast disorders, in at least in terms of OBGYN on this rotation, are primarily focused on, on benign disorders because breast cancers, even though I've heard from some of your colleagues that there have been one or two questions about breast cancer, that is very much managed by general surgery. And it's something that is, as an OBGYN, you're not sort of encouraged to manage yourself because that's very much the mat that involves chemotherapy and surgery and really everything else is under the auspices of breast surgeons and general surgeons, surgical oncologists really. However, um, OBGYNs remain the front line in terms of screening for these things. And that's why it's very important. You know, I've, I've recently had a patient who we actually just did a routine mammogram on and she had something called BIREDS5, which I'll go over that briefly. You don't have to memorize that, but that means that there's likely a malignancy there. So um, sometimes we catch these things and then it's up to us to make sure that they get plugged in with care. That's why um, OBGYN does have that primary care aspect. That's very important to recognize and that's why they want you to know about it because it's practical. Now, in terms of uh, these, these conceptual things, the most that I will say even in practice is, is that you come across it and then you make sure that they get their appropriate care and you follow it up and that's pretty much it. As such, a lot of this seems to be academic but it is something that you have to know about and they ask you about. So it, and it's, it's very high yield for your exams. They like to ask you about it, which is pretty frustrating out of all the things they can ask for, <laughs> but um, benign breast disorders. So, okay. Um, okay. Um, so, a woman will come to you, usually young women will say, okay, I have, I have pain, right? So that's referred to medically as nostalgia. So what it's important, you know, what your options are and what you do about it and what it could be. And that's really the point because you have to convey that to the patient themselves and say, well, you know, this is what's going on and this is what to expect. And also you can make a diagnosis fairly reliably because um, a lot of these conditions are either going to be pregnancy related or it has to do with um, hormonal fluctuations because these things, the um, breast pathology is usually estrogen responsive. So on those two um, sort of criteria, you can figure out what's going on. In this presentation, I'm going to mention just some other terms and, and like um, clinical pathology. Not that you need to really know about it, but just so it's, you know what it is, so it's not a distractor. And I'll be pretty clear about that. Um, so we're going to talk about evaluation of nostalgia, which is breast pain. We're going to talk about pregnancy related conditions, benign breast lesions and masses outside of pregnancy. So your non-pregnant patient, if they have, uh, a, a breast mass or breast pain, what that could be. Um, and just briefly what the management algorithms are, but, um, it doesn't have to be, um, so robust in, how you actually manage these things, it's pretty straightforward. Um, this is just a very broad strokes image on your right to kind of show you the different things that you deal with. Your fibroadenoma is your most common solid mass. So it presents as just like a solid tumor, almost like a fibroid would. A, you could have breast cysts, which are fluid filled um, um, masses here. Um, and they're fluctuant and they would present in between these mod, uh, lobules here. An abscess is obviously an infection um, and that can present similar to, similarly as a cyst, but it's gonna be thicker material and usually will have some sort of antecedent event, be it breastfeeding or whatnot. Um, fibrocystic disease, which is actually a term they don't like to use, but it's used all the time, um, is sort of a combination of scarring and having cysts, but as you can appreciate this, the simple cyst here is more discrete as opposed to um, fibrocystic disease is less distinct and more fibrotic. And then you have a tumor, which is unique in that it will actually be spreading and impinging on the other um, uh, structures, which 
the other benign breast disorders do not do. And that's important to know. And that's why you have dimpling of the skin, which is actually one of the worst signs uh, you can have because uh, only, a, <laughs> only a tumor will actually be responsible for doing something like that. Um, so if you see nipple retraction, for example, that's not a great sign, probably worse than say discharge of the nipple. Okay. Um, but so benign breast disease, it, it's a spectrum of disorders uh, that come to clinical attention, uh, usually because of imaging abnormalities. Um, but usually they're not imaged first. It's usually that um, they're either palpable or they're painful to the patient. And that's why they come in. They can say, oh, I felt something, right? Even if it's not painful. Um, and they're concerned about it because uh, breast cancer has a large awareness um, in, in everyday society. So people want, and you know, they can, know some, there's always be someone they'll say, oh, well, you know, I knew somebody who had breast cancer, right? Um, so you have to know how to properly counsel and then do the correct uh, treatment. Um, in addition to alleviating symptoms, because it's not just like, oh, it's not cancer, you're fine. There's things you can do. Um, breath, and it's one of our more common issues, ironically, but we don't, we're the ones who don't really do the much with it. Um, but if you ask people who said, if I have a breast problem, who would I go to? They'd say probably gynecologist, right? Um, so your first step in method of evaluation is obviously you get a history. Sometimes I have a history of breast cancer. Like I remember that when I was in residency, especially um, at Bellevue Hospital, they would say you would kind of start this workup in your history. And then they're like, yeah, I had breast cancer and it was removed at some point. And you're like, oh, okay. You know, so uh, maybe not a mastectomy, but they had something removed. That was so it's like starting from there, you may have just scarring that's picked up on a mammogram. Sometimes you kind of start from ground zero in a patient that doesn't have records and maybe she's international, but so that's pretty important. They'll let you know. You think that, why wouldn't you start with that? But a lot of times if you don't ask, they, they kind of don't come up with it. Um, not that, uh, that, that's just sometimes how it is. Um, you want to characterize the discomfort. Sometimes they have a pain, painful or painless mass. Sometimes they don't have a mass. Sometimes it's just pain, right? Or sometimes they just say something feels different, like you have to, you want to categorize it. Generally, um, if there's any sort of um, pain or something like that, what is, I've, I've found, and, and, you know, foundationally will agree that um, one of your biggest and most successful questions is to say, have you felt something like this before? Because then they will know what that was like. And if it's something that is different and they can tell you this is different you know, then that's something you want to pay more attention to, especially in labor. Sometimes you have a patient and you're like, listen, this is very different and they'll be concerned about it. And that's something that um, you want to take note of. Um, so you want to know if there's nipple discharge or not. Um, obviously, if it's lactationally related, you can have that, but, but things, certain uh, disease states can present with abnormal lactation. Like what? What's an obvious one? Hmm? Yeah, but that's what it is. But what causes it? Yeah, prolactin, like like uh, hyperprolactinemia. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, and then like antipsychotics can do that. Yeah, so that's like a really obvious one that they don't know, but you can pick up pretty quickly. And then um, bloody nipple discharge usually means one thing most often, which is, do you know? It can. The papilloma, the introductory papilloma, inflammatory breast cancer may not present with a bloody nipple discharge, although it can, you get kind of, you could get like a greenish discharge there. You can get bloody discharge for sure, but the introductory papilloma is like usually what causes a bloody nipple discharge. And that's actually something that is, they love to test on because it's, it's very unique, it's reliable, and it actually happens, right? And we're going to talk about that, but that's good. Um, especially to mention the drugs, because that's usually a common thing too. I had a patient one time, she was, um, you know, just an unassuming looking person, you know, and she was having that. And then it turns out she has like very bad bipolar one disorders on a bunch of antipsychotics. You, know, you would not think that, right? But you ask. And then also what's helpful, most EMRs, even if you don't have their history, they do a pull of their pharmacy records. So I was like, well, she, they, last week she picked up all of these things, right? So obviously she's taking them, which means that that's the case. And you ask about that. Um, 
yeah, your pharmacology helps you tremendously, even if the patient's a bad historian. It's like, well, she's taking this medicine. So what does that equal? Um, and then, uh, you know, and then your duration of symptoms and everything else. This is a, like a pretty simple chart to kind of see uh, differences in uh, the breasts that you look for. All right. Now, um, you also have to be pretty aware of like kind of what is normal and what's not. But generally, if you're struggling to find an abnormality and you're not sure, there's probably nothing wrong. <laughs> um, so you do your clinical breast exam, uh, which is, um, there's different ways you can do that. And I'll, I'll show you in the subsequent slides. Your diagnostic imaging then is part of your evaluation. Now, mammogram is what you're going to be using for screening, meaning that there's no known disease. Okay, or, or really risk, uh, uh, risk factors in terms of general screening. So for ACOG, when does screening begin for mammograms? For a specific age mammogram? Yeah. It's past 30. It is past 30, but what's the age? 35. It's actually 40. Oh, wow. You know, it, it's for, for screening stuff for OBGYN, really it's just what ACOG says. All the other task forces, we don't care about. Okay. I don't even, I don't even know what those recommendations are. All I know is, is that that's what ACOG says. And then the only other screening thing that's important for OBGYN is that colon cancer screening is now 45 for everyone. Right. And it used to be 45 if you're black race and 50 otherwise now everybody's 45. Okay. And then DEXA scans 45. I, I mean, 65, unless you have some sort of risk factor, like, like a stress fracture or some other thing. Okay. Um, and then obviously cervical cancer screening, right? And then, so what is, what is the general cervical cancer screening? So if you're, I'll give you a hint. If you're less, if, if you're between 21 and 29, what is it? Every three years. Every three years. Papsomere being cytology alone. Mm -hmm. Now, what it will do is it's reflex to HPV, meaning that if there's an abnormality, they'll automatically send it for HPV typing. Okay. So, and then if you're 30 and above, yeah, it's cytology and co-testing every five years. Okay. Um, and that's pretty much it. Don't worry too much about when to stop because that is, it kind of depends. Yeah. So if a patient has cervical cancer, like I had a question when I got it wrong. I think they were like 55 or something. Yeah. So do you stop at 65 for that patient? or continue for like more years because they have a history of cervical cancer? Generally, you want to keep following them. Um, it, it largely depends on what their treatment course was. But I think in the, the kind of overarching principle is, is that you don't want to say, if there's a, any sort of complicated history, your answer is not to stop at 65. Okay. A lot of people will say, if you have three prior normal in a sequence, that's enough. Some, some say at age 65, if you've had never had any problems with a consistent follow-up, if you've had a, a total hysterectomy for benign disease and never had an abnormal pap smear. So say you had like CIN3 and you had a cone and then you ended up having a hysterectomy thereafter. I mean, you still have to do um, pap smears, the vaginal cuff, for example. But that can be a little tricky. So what you want to remember just as a bigger principle is, is that if they had any problem, the answer is not necessarily to stop at 65. And what they want you to learn on the exam is to not, is that you have to follow it. That's pretty much it. And then the, the, uh, the gynecologic oncologist will determine what their follow-up is. And it largely is a factor of how long they've been disease-free. You got to consider that um, cervical cancer in the later stages isn't managed surgically. So they should have every our cervix and whatnot. Um, if it was caught at an early stage and they did a total hysterectomy with adjuvant, um, I mean, they would do a radical hysterectomy uh, with adjuvant chemo, chemo radiation, then they, they, they may, if it's been so far out, they may stop. That's sort of how it works. Mm -hmm. Um, 
not that this is related to breast disease, but it's just kind of uh, an important thing. With, with oncology, gyne oncology, the bigger principles that you need to be aware of in terms of the primary treatments is what is most helpful. So how is endometrial cancer treated? Your options are surgery, chemothera- ke- chemotherapy, or radiation. Surgery. Yeah, it's primarily a surgical thing. Now you can have neoadjuvant, meaning before, or adjuvant being later, chemotherapy or radiation. You can do like radiation of the cuff, for example, afterwards, depending on if you have certain risk factors. But primarily it's a surgical thing. What about uh, um, cervical cancer? Chemotherapy. Well, it's radiation. radiation. They do chemo radiation, but the chemotherapy is just to sensitize for the radiation. So it's radiation, really. That's what you want to remember. That's why when you have something that's beyond a 1B1, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, one. I believe it's 1B1, um, that surgery is no longer an option. And then you have to remember that it's, a, it's, a, it's an abdominal hysterectomy, not a minimally invasive hysterectomy, because fairly recently, maybe like three years now, actually, during my residency, it was that they thought minimally invasive surgery for cervical cancer was going to help, but it actually makes things worse. Survival is worse. So you do a total abdominal hysterectomy. And the reasons for why they think that is, is kind of maybe because the, the manipulator you put in there might seed things, or maybe because you can't get beyond, you can't get certain traction robotically, for example. Um, you may miss something. They don't really know why, but they know that that's a fact. So um, that's something important to keep. I don't think they'll ask you that, but that's important to know. And then uh, ovarian cancer is treated how? Primarily. Uh, no, actually it's, it's chemotherapy. You can do a debulking surgery to get rid of the tumor burden, but it's an ovarian cancer thing. You're primary, you're primarily managed by chemotherapy. And that's what you tell the patients. You say that is what is expected to treat the ovarian cancer. If you have a big tumor burden, you can do what's called a debulking just to relieve that because then it makes the, it, your job a little bit easier, but ultimately it's chemotherapy. So if you could remember that endometrial cancer is surgery, cervical cancer is, is chemo radiation, but radiation, and then ovarian cancer is chemotherapy, that kind of helps you understand what you do. And that's actually how you do it. When you're, when you're um, if you do OBGYN and you're a resident, that's, that's how you first frame it. And then the other things are kind of nuances. All right. Um, so, the, so really th- that's your screening and that's in terms of gyne oncology. If you can understand that, that's pretty much it. Um, if they ask you about staging, that wouldn't be very nice, but um, <laughs> the, uh, if it involves bowel or bladder, you're looking at a, at a four, right? Stage four. If you have hydronephrosis, you're dealing with stage three. Everything else is kind of a bit more of a nuanced sort of thing. Um, and that's pretty reliable. Okay. So um, any questions about, you know, that sort of rapid fire thing? It's, it's worth reviewing that because that's pretty much a very high yield sort of discussion. And it, that's like your common of common things. You get that, you're already pretty well set. Um, so in terms of imaging, so your screening is mammograms at 40 weeks, um, ultrasound is used in the evaluation of usually if you have a younger patient, younger, meaning less than 40 and say they have a palpable, um, um, breast mass, or especially if it's fluctuant and you think it's a cyst, you, uh, the first step is an ultrasound to evaluate what that is. Okay. And then through the ultrasound, they could also, um, either do a biopsy or, um, there's different ways they could do the biopsies as well. So that's how it goes. Sometimes what'll happen to do a mammogram and then they want, they'll say, all right, we have to look at it with a sonogram because, um, there are just different views and that's also fine. Um, so uh, your MRI is never your first step, okay? And MRIs are only used to, is if you have breast cancer and you're following it, 
or you have a suspicion for breast cancer following, I mean, prior with a mammogram first. MRI is never your first step. And then you do a histological evaluation. You could do your fine needle aspiration, which you would do with an ultrasound. Um, and I have some descriptions about that. Uh, a core needle biopsy, which um, is pretty much the same thing as a fine needle aspiration, only in that you have a solid mass, so you can't aspirate anything. Um, and then your excisional biopsy is what you do when you have something that's more concerning and you want to take the whole thing out. But it's still a biopsy because you're still looking at it. You don't know what it is yet. Um, this is a woman getting a mammogram. So it's a kind of a stand up thing and actually kind of like smushes the breast, which um, is uncomfortable. And women complain about, obviously. And then this is just sort of a breast ultrasound here. Uh, yes. Have a yeah. Women that come in and we, um, uh, say they found like a mass in their um, breast. Yeah. Do you conduct a mammogram on them or ultrasound if they're pregnant? Um, they, but they're probably going to do an ultrasound. Okay. Um, there, I mean, there are the most commonly diagnosed cancer in pregnancy is breast cancer. There's something called pregnancy related breast cancer, which is that it's due to pregnancy, which is pretty uncommon, but it is a thing. So um, what they would do is they would do an ultrasound and if they were concerned, then they would go for an MRI. Right. Yeah. Because while you can do x-rays and even CTs in pregnancy, you know, if you don't have to, you try not to. Right. So an ultrasound will tell you enough. And then if you're really concerned, well, then you just get an MRI. So, um, but that is the thing. It's not common, uh, but, but it is a thing. That's a good question. Um, anything else? Yeah, definitely ask your questions. You feel free to interject. So breast exams, uh, this just shows you a bunch of different ways you could conduct it. You'll see usually um, F where they will, um, where the provider will have uh, do an exam while the patient is lying down, have their arm like this. Sometimes it's helpful, like if you look in C, to have the uh, patient put her hands on her waist, but also she'll kind of push in so the chest wall itself can kind of flex. So you could you make a determination that if something is separate from a chest wall lesion versus like an actual breast lesion, right? Um, and then the, it's described uh, as the areola is kind of the center of a clock, and that's a consistent uh, nomenclature, and that's what's expected. Um, and then here's just another sort of description of what changes will look like. Um, a fine needle aspiration, like I mentioned, is pretty much if you have a lump here, you don't know what it is, but if you could kind of move it back and forth, you, you presume it's a cyst, you essentially have an ultrasound and you put a needle into the cyst and withdraw it and get the fluid and send it off. Pretty straightforward. A core needle biopsy is similar you're still with a little needle, but it has like a punch with it. So it can like get a, a piece of it. Um, and you want to give a lidocaine or something before that. That's not something that OBGYN usually does, though you can. If you're in a lower resource area, you can, or sometimes uh, people in private practice do. The reason why it's, it's not commonly done is just because then that requires you to follow it up and coordinate it and that you're not going to manage it primarily unless that's something within your training and scope, which is cool. I mean, if I could, I would, right? Um, but I don't have time for that. <laughs> I have enough. Um, so those are really your primary evaluations. It's like any other sort of screening and then confirmatory sort of um, uh, process, okay? In terms of further evaluation of what is breast pain. We sort of went over it. Um, and here is specifics in terms of just the, of, of pain itself. It's usually, it's, it's almost about half of the time why patients present, but it's, if it's, it's only about 47% in the study. So usually there's something, usually the presence of something is most concerning, right? Um, so it's usually self-limited. Most women don't require treatment. Um, as I mentioned before, a lot of it is due to hormonal fluctuation because it's estrogen responsive and thereby by the, by the menstrual cycle fluctuation, things can kind of become painful and not, but, but patients don't often associate that. They're like, I'm having my period is one thing. Why should my chest hurt? You know? Um, so the most important thing you want to think about is that if you have like, kind of like a cyclical breast pain, that's really your biggest hint that you're dealing with uh, 
hormonal changes. And more than that, it's something that was broadly de defined in the past as fibrocystic change, even though um, the practice bulletin of ACOG will say it's become obsolete, but I will, most people you speak to still use that term, mainly because the term in its place is a bit more cumbersome. Um, but this image is kind of helpful to understand it. So your healthy breasts is on your left. It has your discrete lobules and whatnot. Your fibrocystic breast disease, which I'm going to refer to it as anyway, in view of what I told you, is you have cystic spaces in between the lobules here. And then there's fibrosis in between it. I don't know if you could appreciate how that area is thickened. On ultrasound, you see, you see your discrete cysts, right? But you also see that this is kind of like hazy because that's your fibrosis. So it's not just like cysts, multiple cysts. It's also the scarring. And then if you do a mammogram, you see it's hazy too. That's sort of the point. And the only reason why I mention that is because the treatment is not really ever excision on that basis. Sometimes there's discrete ones that are pretty big and sometimes you will, but generally the management is not surgical. And that's sort of the point. Um, cyclical breast pain by extension is related to your menstrual cycle. So you're the peak, if, if you have regular cycles, it becomes easier because then you understand how in the beginning phase here, um, your proliferative phase that estrogen peaks up to 14 days when you have your ovulation and then the secretory phase begins. The two thirds of pain uh, of patients with true mastalgia is, is related to hormonal fluctuations and cyclical stuff. Um, in what's most important to remember is that if it is cyclical, it usually is bilateral. Um, because if you're, if you're saying that it's hormonally responsive, then why would only one be affected, right? You can have a mass, like a fibroadenoma. Sometimes it, that is worsened by it, but then it would always kind of be present, you know? So also we'll get into this, but bilateral um, breast pathology is also if you have breast engorgement or really anything pregnancy related, because there's no way you can have one or the other. If you have breast engorgement, it's both or none. So non-cyclical breast pain is kind of not the point of what we need to know, but you have to know the difference. So things that can happen is that, first of all, it doesn't follow a usual menstrual pattern. A lot of these things are not really breast in and of themselves, but are in the location. A good example of this is heradenitis spurtiva, which is kind of the, which is kind of a spectrum of disorders where you have this basically low level of infection. You can see it anywhere, usually in folds and things, but commonly you'll see it under the breast folds. But it could be, you know, you see that in the man sometimes. This is something that men can have. I mean, as it's not related to pregnancy, I mean, to women's health specifically. But that, if you see that, um, that sort of appearance. And that might be a reason why they come in for breast pain. And the treatment for that is what? Antibiotics. It's excision, really. Um, you, it's managed with antibiotics, but the, but the treatment is excision because this is not going away. These are kind of like, if you culture them, some, you, don't, you often don't get a discrete organism because that's not the way that it works. You can. And then in which case, then you would treat it with antibiotics. But, um, and this usually comes back. That's why uh, the treatment is excision. You would think that it was antibiotics, but it, it's, it's, it's excision. Because I remember I had a patient, like I, I, we cultured the thing directly, like no mistake, you know, and, and it didn't come back as any discrete organism because that's not how it works, you know, but it often is managed with medication, but like what's the primary treatment is what sort of what I'm getting at is excision. Um, you just have large breasts for the body size. Um, you don't want to rule that out. That's pretty obvious. If they're taking hormones for anything that can cause breast pain in general, even OCPs, if they have estrogen in them. Um, and then you have your, um, spectrum of, uh, you know, breast cysts, um, and then obviously benign masses can cause that. Um, 
And then obviously in the back of your mind, you're thinking of things like uh, breast cancers, but then there will be other signs you look for. Um, extra mammary pain is something that you need to be aware of, but you really have to rule out most other things uh, to make sure that this is not related to the chest wall. Um, sometimes you'll hear something called Tietze syndrome, which is uh, if you have acute coronary syndrome or at least the symptoms of that, but it's really related to the chest wall. That's what that is. Um, but um, usually this is history driven. Sometimes if you have, uh, you get a history from a patient who had um, a bout of um, physical activity, lifting things, moving things or whatever. And they're like, oh, I have breast pain. It's like, well, you probably just pulled a muscle, right? Um, especially if it's with movement. So stuff like that is important. But um, otherwise, this is not, certainly not your first step, or at least thought. So questions with that? It's pretty straightforward. So now when we're getting into pregnancy-related things, the most important thing you need to know about really is breast engorgement. Um, so breast engorgement is when you have kind of have uh, the lobules are swollen because of they're basically, um, there's no appropriate letdown of the milk production in the, in the breast lobules. And, and it's due to edema of that. This happens 24 to 72 hours postpartum usually. And you know what a lot, and a lot of times you'll see it in like first time moms who just don't want to breastfeed and they don't think that they have to do anything about it. Um, while it could also happen in other circumstances, but that's a common reason. And the thing with breast engorgement is it presents with a low-grade fever. And sometimes the fever can be a high fever too. I remember as a resident, I, I, as an intern, I would always miss that. You know, a patient comes to the ER and she has fever and she delivered. I'm like, oh, well, you know, she must have endometritis. Fundus is not tender, but she has a fever, you know? So what does that equal? And like, then, then my senior would be like, did you, did you examine her breasts? I'm like, nope, I did not. So then when you go and do that, you'll feel like nodularity. It feels like very firm, almost like, like rocks. <laughs> and, and then that's your answer. Okay. So um, what's happening is, is that your, your lobules here are just, they're swollen. This is what's firm. They're engorged and then they're demitis. And it's painful. And then that swelling is what also then will cause mom to have a fever. Um, don't, yeah, don't forget that it can give you a fever. That's probably the most important thing because then you're thinking infection. But if you haven't ruled that out, um, that's usually the case. It will spontaneously resolve with conservative management. Um, compresses, be them cold or hot. Um, and then just uh, anything to facilitate uh, uh, milk letdown, which is usually breastfeeding, pumping, compresses to get things to move. That's, that's your mainstay. Um, and then obviously you can use analgesics like acetaminophen or ibuprofen for, for pain management thereafter. The answer is not things like um, dopamine uh, antagonists, or things like that, that's not what you do, okay? Um, yeah, and this is what this is saying here, is that drug therapy, but that drugs is referring to those, the, the, uh, the, that affect dopamine, because theoretically that would impair milk delivery and stuff like that, that's not the answer. Um, this is something that's popular, it's like a very midwife type thing, but it works. Um, <laughs> basically, you know, you kind of, you you put these uh, these leaves on the breast and it just helps with relief. Okay, that's that, that's the bottom line with it. Um, and stuff like that works. So, you know, you don't wanna knock it too much. Um, now, you can get mastitis related to lactation though. Okay, meaning that these lobules and the skin get swollen. Now, this is different from breast cellulitis, which I'll describe to you, okay? So obviously, lactational mastitis is in the presence of breastfeeding within the first three months. Usually, it's engorgement, and then because the swelling continues, um, uh, in like frank inflammation can happen. Um, 
while they don't really have a, a good, like a categorical reason, the, the thing you want to think about is you, you so a lot, oftentimes it's due to breakages in the skin too, because the main, um, the main uh, pathogen you see is Staph aureus, which is on the skin. So that tends to make sense, right? Um, but if you have ongoing engorgement, that's kind of not dealt with, that can also cause a uh, disruption in the integrity and then the bacteria can go. Um, that being said, you still manage it conservatively for the most part. Um, and if you're, if it kind of persists uh, beyond conservative management, then you kind of empirically treat it with, uh, you assume it's um, your sort of, um, staff or, or strep related, and you treat it with your, um, penicillins. You don't really do imaging and you don't do labs or anything like that, apart from maybe a CBC to look for a white count if you have a fever, but you don't culture or do any of that stuff for just mastitis itself. Okay. So then you would go straight to either dicloxacillin or if you're suspecting MRSA, um, now, and you would suspect MRSA, in patients that have medical complications, say if they're like diabetic or something like that, then you would put them on like a Bactrim, but you want to encourage breastfeeding. So you want to make sure you could do something that is not going to interfere with that. So usually that's why your um, dicloxacillin is um, preferred and you're not going to use methicillin because of, you know, methicillin resistance, especially around these parts. Um, and that's pretty much all we had said. Now, if you have something that's resistant to treatment, then your next step is to do an ultrasound. And what you're looking for is a breast abscess in that case. You'll have a localized collection of infection, which is an abscess, and that will be unilateral. And usually that's like, if the treatment isn't working, that's the next step. Okay. You do your ultrasound and then you'll see it. Um, but the mainstay is symptomatic treatment. These are certain things that you can um, recommend to your patient. Uh, this is very much, uh, a lot of hospital systems have uh, lactation nurses who are really the biggest people to do this because um, it's something that's ubiquitous and very important for women. We have a really great lactation nurse here. And um, if you have, if you're interested in that, you really should speak to her, she's great. Um, we're baby friendly here as well. So that's also a big deal for us. Um, baby friendly is, you know, that international initiative where more or less the institution itself has demonstrated that it's has systems in place to encourage breastfeeding and, and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, we kind of really reviewed this. There are supplements that have been used for prevention and things like that. I mean, but the bottom line is that they'll never test you on this, but just so you know, I mean, because a patient might ask you or even you're curious yourself to say, oh, well, you know, I heard of this, a lactia, right? Uh, they sent me a flyer of it. They're like, it works. I'm like, does it now? So I looked into it. And, you know, it's based, it's based on, they kind of pool a bunch of studies together. And then they said, oh, well, this is like that. So this must work. That's sort of where they get the evidence from, which is not totally, you know, it's not totally wrong. Uh, but so in my mind, if this is not an excessive cost to a patient, I would say, yeah, go for it. Um, but that's basically the bottom line for these probiotics is that like it's a lactobacillus, which is the main flora of, of the vagina as well. Apparently that is helpful in reducing um, the development of mastitis or engorgement and things like that. So if you have it on hand and it's easy to get, go for it. Um, certainly won't hurt. I mean, but they have like kind of like a robust recommendation. They say lactation decreased and I mean, infection decreased by 51% of clinical mastitis. But then you have to also understand how the study was conducted. And then you're just, I'm, really that's the point of your sort of scholarly activity block. Like if you look into these studies, you have to see under the conditions for which it was studied. And, you know, a lot of times you'll find is that the environments in these studies are like, just like so artificial. Like that's not how it would go down in, in say, especially in a community setting, right? It's not that it doesn't have value. It's just that, you know, you got to make sure where your recommendation is coming from and how you apply it. Um, so other things that can happen, you can get a galactic a galactoseal, uh, 
is um, it's just a milk retention cyst. It's kind of like uh, just a gland got pinched off. And um, uh, then this collects, this is actually an x-ray. This is a mammogram, okay? And you just see a fluid level. If you ever see a straight line on an x-ray, you know that there's a problem. And this is a fluid level. Now, how big of a problem is it? Um, this is not a problem at all, just because if this is a distractor, you know what it is, okay? Breast abscesses, we already kind of mentioned this. Um, you do your ultrasound and you see something nasty like this, okay? This is the breast parenchyma on your right, and then this is your purulent material. So that has to be drained, okay? When it's small, you can do a needle aspiration of it. When it's large, you got to have a surgical drainage of it. And that's really the bottom line. Now, to wrap this up, in terms of just benign lesions in general that are not pregnancy related, there's a, a couple of things you need to be aware of. There's non-proliferative and then proliferative without atypria. Non-proliferative means that they're not growing. They're not getting bigger. I think proliferative, like to proliferate is to become more, right? So a non-proliferative lesion isn't getting bigger. If you have a cyst, it's a cyst and it's not really going to get bigger. Okay, unless it's bleeding into it or something, but that's that's an ovary ovarian sort of thing because that not in the breast. Um, now you got to consider that this comes from the practice bulletin, but hyperplasia and primary apocrine chains that's not a that's not a lesion. You're never going to see a lesion or feel a lesion. This is a histological thing, so it's a bit of a misnomer. So really, you just want to think for non-proliferative, it's simple cysts, and we already kind of beat that to death. You do your ultrasound, you could do a fine needle aspiration and take it from there. Now, proliferative without atypia means that they're, gonna, they're growing, but it's not cancer. It's not atypical cells, right? So your most common is your fibroadenoma, which we'll get into, maybe. Okay. So giant fibroadenoma is just a bigger fibroadenoma. It's a discrete entity. We, your introductal papilloma is, um, that's where we mentioned the bloody nipple discharge. And then this other stuff is similar in to what I just mentioned in that it's not a true lesion. It's a histological thing. So really just focus on essentially these two, the fibroadenoma and the introductal papilloma. And then there's something called a phylloides tumor, which is about, which is a bit confusing, which I'll explain. So breast cysts, we really reviewed them. Um, the bottom line is, is that they're usually always benign on the breast. And if there's a problem, uh, if they're bothersome, you could do a fine needle aspiration and then take it from there. Usually it's not concerning for malignancy without other sort of findings. Um, you do. This is another image on the left of a fine needle aspiration where you coordinate it with your ultrasound. You stick the needle in the cyst, drain it, and you're done. And this is an example of a breast cyst. It's just a kind of anechoic looking thing. And that could very much be an ovarian cyst too, right? Simple cyst. All simple cysts will look the same. They're just fluid filled and ultrasound. Um, with your proliferative without atypia, the most common breast mass you'll see is a fibroadenoma in a young woman. And then if you're gonna see any sort of breast pathology on this rotation, this is what you'll see. And we see it here every so often because it's common. Um, you basically would send that patient for an ultrasound if you weren't sure if it was a simple cyst or solid mass. Um, and then your differences are, are in this picture here. On the left is a, is, is a cyst and on your right is your mass. And if you can appreciate it, it's just kind of like a hazier looking thing because it's solid. What helps you also in radiology is, is that if you know what the surrounding things are, what does it look like? And if it looks like that, it's more the character of the tissue is more similar. You know, sometimes if you have a lipoma, you can tell it's a lipoma because it looks just like the fat that's surrounding it, you know? Um, so that's kind of a way you would know one way or another if your imaging is good. But um, that's a mammogram of an adenoma, a fibroadenoma, and then the treatment is excision. And it looks very much like a fibroid. And that's pretty much it. They excise it, and that's it. Universally benign. Now, a phylloides tumor, sometimes they like to ask you about just because it's kind of confusing. Now, what... So this is char characterized as a benign lesion, okay? 
And then you look at it on the right and you're like, are you really? But um, so this is the deal with it. So it can have local recurrence and it can have distant metastatic disease, right? And you, I just told you it's a benign disease. And um, they're usually larger and they have rapid growth. Um, and as such, because it does this sort of thing, an excisional biopsy is what is appropriate for phylloides tumors because excisional biopsy, meaning you take all of it out if you are not sure. Now, why is it a benign? It can have malignant change, okay? It's benign because while it does this craziness, it's not gonna kill you. That's the way you gotta think about it. So it has a benign course. There's morbidity for sure in that, but it won't kill you. So it's not malignant, got it? So it's kind of like, that's what they mean by benign, but it can behave like a sarcoma would. It can have mets and things like that. And that's still troublesome on its own. For example, um, another thing that's similar is you can have something called intravenous leiomyomatosis. Pretty much it's fibroids that get into the bloodstream. So then they present as masses in numerous places. And it looks like metastatic disease. And you're like, oh, but you remove everything and it's benign. That's benign disease because it's not going to kill you. Get it? Um, it's confusing, and that's why they may ask you about that. Um, it's called phylloides because its pathology looks like a leaf, and histologists and pathologists love that. Um, but otherwise, it just presents as a solid mass, and that's what it looks like on mammogram. It's a solid mass. That's all you know based upon this. Like the picture you showed us before this one, would the patient get a mastectomy or the excision? Because it looks like it's affected pretty much. With this one, they probably would do a, mastect a unilateral mastectomy, I would imagine. Uh, depending on the extent, so this patient would end up with an MRI, right? Um, because you're considering malignancy. If there's areas in which you could spare the breast, they might do that. But what they'll probably, what they end up doing in situations like this is that they usually do some sort of plastic surgery to reconstruct it just for cosmetic purposes, just for cosmesis. But something like that, they would be concerned about, um, and they would do an excisional biopsy, which probably would involve a unilateral mastectomy. So bottom, the bottom line, very different from a fibromyadenoma, right? Fibrom, fibromyadenoma will never do that. And this isn't breast cancer, okay? So it's like, that can be a little tricky. Images in this are very helpful to, just to say that was what a fibroadenoma would look like on the left. Fibrocystic disease, you have fibrosis and, and, and cysts. That's the difference. And just to try to get it straight in your head. Your introductory papilloma is just a papilloma this projection within um, the lactiferous ducts. Okay. Um, and then basically you want to do a biopsy of that. Bloody nipple discharge is a hallmark of this. It's a benign lesion. Um, but Sometimes this happens in the setting of other things um, that are more atypical. So that's why uh, an excisional biopsy is recommended on that basis, just to make sure that um, what they say is, is that like when you have an introductory papilloma, sometimes there are other things happening in the background of it that are unrelated, probably because there's some sort of process that's causing abnormal growth and that thing just grew in and of itself is not um, malignant, but it kind of shouldn't be there. Right. Um, but it looks like your papillomatous projection and that causes bleeding because of interference on that basis. Now management algorithms, you'll hear BIRAD zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. You'll never be tested on that, but just be aware of what it is. Pretty much zero is incomplete. One and two are benign. Three is indeterminate, four is suspicious, five is malignant, and six is that you know you're dealing with a malignancy, but you're following it. Do not need to memorize that, but that those terms are thrown around all the time, so you have to be aware of it at least during your clinical spaces. This is a, a flow chart of pretty much all we just discussed. I don't really find them too helpful, but certain people like them, and especially ACOG, so there you go. Um, and that's pretty much it. If you know that, that's it. <laughs> with breast disease. You look no further. That's pretty much all you need to know. So any questions with that stuff?
review it so you get it straight in your head. But that's basically it. What you consider is, is that, um, so breast cellulitis, where you don't have any history of breastfeeding or anything like that, it's kind of like just like this patchy infection. Um, they're probably not going to ask you much about that because that's a general surgery thing. And then that can kind of progress to necrotizing fasciitis, but that's usually related to skin things. Usually poor nutrition, smokers, stuff like that. They get like these mastitis things, which are, which are these um, just infections of the skin. And because a breast is kind of a covered area, that that's kind of what happens. Right. So that's really it. <laughs>